Once, after drinking some milk, he correctly stated that it was from a goat that was black and who had given birth only once. On another occasion, he saw a girl for the first time and greeted her with a hello maiden, while the next morning he told her hello woman, and it was in fact true that she had had sex for the first time during that night. Yes, today's figure is said to have made deductions that would impress Sherlock Holmes himself, but you may know him better for his atomic theory. That's right, we're covering Democritus as part of the atomist duo. Hello, this is the Epicurean Stoic and welcome back to my ancient Greek philosophy series. So far, we've covered the Miletian natural philosophers, then Heraclitus, Parmenides and the Alearics, and finally Empedocles. Today we will cover Lefkipus and Democritus, so let's jump right in. Ah, the atomists. They're a weird case. We barely know anything certain about Lefkipus, with some later philosophers claiming that a lot of what Democritus said were actually Lefkipus' teachings and that Democritus was his student, while others omit Lefkipus altogether as if he didn't exist. In any case, I will follow tradition and treat them as one entity, in a sense, going with what Democritus said because we're a bit more certain about it, whether he was building on Lefkipus' views or not. We don't know where Lefkipus was from, but he seems to have settled in Avdira and created a school, where Democritus was a student. Democritus was definitely from Avdina, and so we have our first group that is kind of in between the Ionian Greeks and the Greeks of Magna Graecia. We know that Lefkipus was even more of a determinist than Empedocles, and that he elevated the necessity of Anaximander to an even higher importance. He said that nothing happens at random, but everything for a reason and as the effect of necessity, and this deterministic outlook was definitely part of the atomist project to a degree, something that only resurfaced in Western thought with Leibniz and his principle of sufficient reason some 2100 years later. So, the atomists wanted to explain the observed natural phenomena with a system that was more rigorous in its causal explanations than that of the natural philosophers from Miletus, but they also didn't want to take the Empedocles route of positing external causes, the two forces, or resort to the Eleatic position that what we observe are but illusions in which there is no truth at all. In fact, they would take a much more robust empiricist position saying that the senses are indeed the way to reach objective knowledge about the physical world. How did they achieve that? As we saw before in this series, the Eleatics rejected the existence of both void and another being, and so they rejected the possibility of motion, with Empedocles disagreeing with them for the latter, positing more than one true being. Well, if Empedocles opened the pluralism door, showing a way out of or a correction to Eleatic metaphysics, the atomists demolished the whole wall, because they also disagreed with the first part. Void is indeed non-being for them, but it does exist. Being is material, corporeal, while the void is immaterial, but it nevertheless still exists. So for the atomists, void is the opposite of full, with the corresponding pairs full void, thing nothing, being non-being, explaining the placement of void in their ontology, saying that being does not exist to a greater extent than non-being. Thus, not only can the atomists explain motion and change, but they can do it better than Empedocles, because now they don't have to accept the true beings as collectively all-encompassing. The existence of void allows for beings to be as small as anybody wants them to be, and here the atomists use the paradox of Zeno against him. If infinite divisibility is problematic, as Zeno says, and his response of rejecting the possibility of motion is not to be accepted by the atomists, then why not just reject the infinite divisibility? Thus, the atomists gain their name. They posited infinite small beings, which are just like the Eleatic single being, uncreated, imperishable, compact, etc., but there's infinitely many of them, and they are mobile, given the existence of void. Most importantly, just like the one being for Parmenides, these beings are indivisible, and the word for that is atomon, that which cannot be cut into smaller pieces. This is why, when 19th century scientists encountered tiny particles that they could not divide, they mistakenly called them atoms, but philosophically the atomic theory equally applies to the elementary particles currently accepted by the standard model. This is not the only occasion where the atomists would be consistent with 19th and 20th century science. Their empiricism would lead them to a scientifically oriented verificationist stance, in that what matters and can be known is what leads to conclusions concerning the future using what can be observed as a guide for said conclusions and that phenomena that facilitate the understanding of unseen things are necessary for knowledge. At the same time, the atomists would see Parmenides' deductive, valid argument method and raise it to a search for a sound argument, whereby a sound argument is a valid argument whose premises are all actually true. 
And how were they to find the truth of their premises? Empirical validation. Karl Popper, one of the most important philosophers of science and proponent of falsificationism, which states that if a claim cannot be falsified, it is not a scientific claim, praised the atomists because they offered the first physical hypothesis that was a direct result of a falsifying deductive argument in response to what they did to the arguments of the Eleatics. Okay, but how do all these individual indivisible beings form what we see around us? Again, expanding on Empedocles' mingling, the atomists gave the atoms differing sizes and shapes and talked of compounds, i.e. atoms that stick together because they have complementary or symmetrical etc. shapes and sizes. Think of today's molecule. Then, depending on the number of individual atoms in a compound, as well as the orientations, let's say, of each atom and their collective arrangement, different compounds will slowly gain different properties. So, the atomists truly elevated Anaximenes' insight of reducing the qualitative differences between the different substances and objects to quantitative ones. Moreover, for Democritus, the fundamental intrinsic motion of atoms is oscillation, of vibration, as they wobble all the time, something that also factors into how strong they might adhere to other atoms in a compound. So, all the change we observe is due to the formation and breakdown of all the different compounds of atoms, lending more power to Democritus' epistemological statement, truth is in the depth. He, like Empedocles, viewed the senses as the foundation for knowledge formation, but he did not pretend it's an easy process. It is necessary to recognize that man is separated from reality. Like Heraclitus, he claimed that the path to knowledge begins with acknowledging our ignorance and the simple, true nature of the world. Only instead of logos, his materialist philosophy's choice for the foundational belief is that the only things that exist are atoms and void. Lastly, when it comes to ethics, Democritus was clear. Having prudence or wisdom is key, because despite the universe's deterministic nature, humans have consciousness and we're free to make our own choices for which we are responsible. The way he squares up the determinism of nature with libertarianism, i.e. the view that humans have free will, is not so clear, but he appeals to the existence of chance, defined as things that we don't know the causes of. Seems like a flimsy explanation, but he was the first to explicitly address this, so let's cut him some slack. So yeah, personal responsibility for our actions is what should guide us to prudence, which in turn is the best way of making the right choices and living a good life. Out of prudent thinking come about these three things, deliberating well, speaking unerringly, and doing what ought to be done. This goal for Democritus was euthymia, translated as contentment, felicity, or happiness. This good disposition of the soul means moderation and constant alertness towards bettering ourselves. It resides neither in herds nor in gold, but in nurturing our character. And while that is hard, much like any other effort, it becomes easier the more we keep doing it. This focus on character is also apparent in Democritus' view that we should not commit sins for our own character's sake, rather than any lack of material benefit, etc. A connection that forms the basis of all virtue ethical theories that are prevalent from Socrates onwards. Thus, while Democritus did not use his atoms to simultaneously explain his views on metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics, like Empedocles and Heraclitus had done before him, he gave humanity a good and fruitful foundation for both scientific advancements as well as ethical progress. Some might say it is a pity then that Platonism and Aristotelianism won over and drowned out the atomists. But just like Heraclitus, Democritus survived in many of the teachings of Socrates and through him all the later Greek philosophical schools. This move by Democritus, however, of distinguishing the philosophical structure of metaphysical versus ethical theories, hints at the great shifts that were happening in the trends of thought of his time. He was a contemporary of the Sophists, who, along with Socrates, were moving away from metaphysics, abandoning natural philosophy, and instead focusing on the man part of the man versus nature dichotomy. In this sense, building from what Empedocles had done, the atomists represent the last valiant effort of natural philosophy to reinstate itself as a worthy subject of inquiry, breaking through the obstacles and hurdles placed by the Eleatics, and in the process giving us gems of insights about how the world works that would only be matched two millennia later. For this, they deserve our praise. This has been the Epicurean Stoic, and thank you very much for watching this video. This caps the pre-Socratic section of our series, and it sets the stage for the world-ending battle between the Sophists and Socrates. At least that's what Plato would want us to believe, and maybe he was right. In any case, this will be the topic of our next video, which will be the first chapter in the Socrates slash Plato section of the series, and so take a short break to prepare those videos. If you like the content so far, press like and subscribe to my channel to be here when the next video drops. Until then, have a great day, 
Remember to not be a show-off with your very astute deductions, well, at least not too much, and as always, seek virtue.